Amen. I know Pastor Adrian asked me to minister on growth. Amen. And I said, I'm just going to be a little bit disobedient this week. I'll just be a bit naughty. Amen. But I want to speak this morning on, because while visiting the flock this week and while praying and having telephone calls from people in this congregation, I felt that I should speak on don't curse your crisis. Don't curse your crisis. And I'll give you reasons why. You should not curse your crisis. And the word crisis, what does crisis mean? Intense difficulty. Intense difficulty. It means hardships. Amen? Severe suffering. And I tried to make it a bit plain. When you're going through pain, when you're going through your storm, when you're going through your troubles and heartaches, when you're going through in, intense financial difficulties and crisis, when you're going through your sickness, headaches, migraine, hospitalizations, when you're going through your struggles in marriage and and heading for divorce, when you're going through the pains of death, don't curse your crisis. Don't curse that difficult time that you are going through. I wish I died. You'll find that in scripture. We'll go through that if we have the time. When you're going through severe suffering and pain and, and struggles, when you're going through long-term unemployment, when you're going through challenges, financial challenges in business and contract challenges in business, and you're going through intense financial difficulties, when you're going through terminal illnesses and sicknesses and disease and the doctor has just diagnosed you cancerous, or the doctor has diagnosed you that you've got severe heart conditions. Or the doctor could have diagnosed you with kidney failure. You're going, you're going through diabetic conditions. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. It says, beloved, is writing to the church. Amen. He's writing to the Christian church. He's writing to the church and he says, beloved, don't think it is strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you, which is to test you. Amen. As though some strange things happened to you. I want to just encourage you. Peter is writing to the church and he says, The things that you are going through, don't think that they are strange. Because it happened to somebody in this congregation. It's just that you don't know it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. When I listened to all of the podcasts and I was really carried away last week when our sister spoke about Bulelo, how the brick walls, the building fell upon him and uh, how her child was diagnosed. But when you saw the child running, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, there are people in the house that's going through things worse than you are. You know when Elijah was running away from Jezebel. He 
thought that he was the only one left. He thought that he was the only one that now existed. Now he must go through the pain. And Obadiah the prophet says, no, I have taken another hundred. I have hidden them in the caves. I came to tell you today, you are not the only one that's going through what you are going through. Others around you, in your community, in this church, are going through some strange things that you have already gone through. And the scripture says, he has come just to try you. Amen? Amen? It's come just to try your faith. Try the word that is on the inside of you. It has come to test you. It's come to place your back against the wall. And there's no way out. Amen. And it says, but rejoice. Say rejoice. Say rejoice. rejoice. Come on, say, but rejoice. rejoice. But rejoice. rejoice. You're going through sickness, rejoice. Rejoice. You're going through hardship, rejoice. You're going through challenges in marriage, rejoice. You're going through diseases, rejoice. Ah, it's quiet. It's quiet. Amen. Say rejoice. Rejoice. Say rejoice. Rejoice. He says, but rejoice. In as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. Then when all his glory shall be revealed. You shall be made glad with exceeding joy. Amen. While you're going through your pain, you cannot see the victory. While you're going through your pain, you cannot see the success that God has planned for your life. While you're going through your pain, you cannot see the bigger picture of success, victory, promotion for where God is taking you. He says, while you are going through your pain, you are are going through the sufferings of Christ. Amen. Christ suffered. Can I say this? Can I say it? You will also suffer. I will also suffer. Oh, what is he preaching? What is he teaching? I want to say to you today, Christianity is not a bed of roses. If Christ went through suffering, you will go through suffering. But how you behave in the time of your suffering. Words that flow out of your mouth in the time of your suffering. Are you on your knees in the time of your suffering and pain? Amen. When you are going through your wilderness... When you are going through your wilderness. Wilderness means dry, desolate periods in your life. Amen. When your cupboards are empty. Friends are gone. Living on overdraft. Living from hand to mouth. When you are having troubles and challenges at work. And in business. When you are going through dryness in your life. You don't sense the joy and the peace of God in your life. When you are going through your wilderness. Don't curse your crisis. Because your faith is being tested. A faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. 
A faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. So if God can trust you, he's going to throw you into the fire. If God can trust you, then he is going to lead you into the wilderness. Amen. Most times, God leads us into the wilderness. He takes us by our hand and he loses us in the wilderness and he disappears. Oh yeah. Luke chapter 4 says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and led him into the wilderness. Amen? When you look at the life of Job, Amen. When you look at the life of Job, there was a conversation between God and Job. Amen. Job was minding his own business. But when God said to Job, to Satan, go and try him. Go and try him. Many of things that you are going through, permission was given by God. For Satan to try you. Some strange things that you are going through. Was God given permission. And now Satan is beating you up. Satan is beating me up. Amen. Amen. We're going to look at that story just now. Amen. Amen. How do you know that you are in the wilderness? How do you know that when you are going through crisis, how do you know that you are in your wilderness? Number one, struggling to find meaning and purpose in life. Once you had a dream, once you had this joy to serve God, once you were anointed and called, once there was a definite purpose before your journey. But today you are finding it hard. You are struggling to find meaning to your purpose. You are struggling to find meaning to life. It seems that life has brought so much of confusion in your decision making. Number two. When you find it difficult to forgive yourself and forgive others for their past mistakes. Amen. When you are living a life of unforgiveness and you're finding it difficult to forgive yourself for the things that you have done because now you are continuously condemning yourself and you are bringing yourself to a point of failure. When you forgive, when you don't forgive others who have hurt you and offended you, abused you verbally and emotionally, when you find that, you find it difficult. You must know that you are not being led by God. You are in the wilderness. Feeling overwhelmed and hopeless in the face of challenges and trials. When challenges come your way, when trials come your way, when difficult moments come your way, and these challenges, you don't have the strength to cross over. You don't have the strength to fight. You don't have the strength to pray. You don't have the strength to fast. When the feelings of hopelessness comes and you are on the verge of giving up, you are in the wilderness. When you're running on empty, and you are running on low. Amen. You're living on survival mode. You're living on. You're, you're living on strength from yesterday. You just don't feel like getting out of bed. You just don't feel like taking the first step of faith. And coming to the house of God. 
When you're running low, feeling depressed, feeling anxious, feeling as a failure, feeling as, as one who is about to give up when you are running low and running on empty, you are in your wilderness. Amen? But this is very important. When you don't feel like praying, when you don't feel like reading the word of God, when you don't feel like coming to the house of prayer, when you feel like isolating yourself from those that are around you to help you come back to Christ, when you shut your phone on Christian leadership, when you don't open your house for a cell meeting and allow people to come in and be a blessing and an encouragement to you and your children, you are in the wilderness. Amen? The purpose of the wilderness. The purpose of the wilderness. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2. And thou shalt remember. I don't know why this word is coming so strongly in this meeting. From the time Pastor Adrian came up and he said, remember, 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 remember. Amen. God is saying something to us, I think, very, very specifically this morning. He's calling us back to remembrance. And if we fail to remember, we will eat the fruit of our land. We will eat the fruit of our disobedience. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. Amen. They were in the wilderness not a year, not a day, not two days. Some of you are in your wilderness one month and you feel like giving up. Some of you are in your wilderness and you are going through your pain just for two months and you feel like quitting on God. Amen. And the Bible says, God led them. Amen. Amen. When you are going through your wilderness, don't think that God is not with you. Don't feel that God has abandoned you. Amen. He is leading you very silently. He is leading you very quietly. He is leading you without making his presence, uh, presence seen and known to you. Amen. But in that quietness period of your wilderness and how you are navigating. Amen. He says, I, I put you into the wilderness, number one, to humble you. Say, humble you. Say, Lord, humble me. Say, Lord, kill the pride in me. Kill the self in me. Let my dependency be upon God. You're saying it as if you got constipation. Say, Lord, humble me. Say it better. Say, Lord, humble me. So many a times we are full of pride and self. Amen. We think, many of you think where you are at at this time financially, spiritually, mentally, socially. Where you are at this time in your life, many of you give glory to self. I did this. I achieved this. I brought this in. If it was not for my experience, if it was not for my knowledge, if it was not for my education, I came to tell you today without God. We are nothing. Without God, you have never been where you are. 
Amen? Amen? The success in your life is because of God. The house you have in your life is because of God. The children you have in your life is because of God. The car you drive is because of God. The money you have in your wallet is because of God. How can you, knowing that God has done so much, depend upon your own strength, depend upon your own self, point it to your education, or point it to the contacts you have, and you, you, you take God out of the picture. And God says, He says, I put you into the wilderness, number one, to humble you, number two, to prove you. Amen? To see what you are made of. What substance you are made from. Amen? Amen? If you go to buy a car, you just don't go and buy it. See the picture and say, send me this car. Then you're foolish. If you're buying something, if you're purchasing something, you need to prove it. You need to test it. You need to test, test it on a drive. Amen. And it says, number, number two, to prove it. And number three, to see what's in your heart. Amen. To humble you, to prove you, and to see what's in your heart. Amen. Amen. The abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. Above all things in our life, the heart is the most desperately wicked. Uh, I only can hear amen from the, from the choir. Amen. So, don't curse your crisis. There are 10 things why you should not curse your crisis. 10 points. I don't think I can do anything more. Number one, it is your crisis that will take you where you want to go. It is your crisis that will take you to the place where you want to go. Number two, your crisis will help you handle, will help you handle truth that you have been taught. Your crisis is going to help you handle the truth that you have been taught. I'm going to explain all of that if I have the time. Number three, your crisis will help you discover your true identity. Your crisis will help you discover your true identity. Your crisis will show you who is really on your side. Amen. Amen. When everything is well, friends are plenty. Amen. Your crisis will show you who is on your side. Your crisis will push you to your miracle moment. Your crisis will push you to your miracle moment. Your crisis might be the indicator that you need to change your spiritual location. Or you have outgrown the level where you are at. Simply meaning that when you have come too comfortable in your Christian walk, amen, no more sorrow, no more worries, no more pain. And when, when comfortableness gets hold of your life and you don't feel like shifting, moving, going forward, going backward, God allows a crisis to come into your life so that he can relocate you and take you where you need to go. Don't curse your crisis. Your crisis can push you to your promotion. Your crisis will push you to your promotion. 
Your crisis has been designed or your crisis is the vehicle, amen, that will take you to your destiny. Your crisis provides you the opportunity to take dominion. If you don't fail in the hour of your crisis, if you don't quit in the hour of your crisis, you can take dominion over everything that the devil throws at you. Amen. Your crisis fuels you for your personal revival. Your crisis, listen, so many of you, a year ago you were so anointed. A year ago you were so contaminated with the Holy Ghost fire. So many of you were so full of fire. You had such great energy worshiping God. You had such great anointing flowing through your life. But this, this year, this time, you're running low. You're running empty. You're running dry. God allows a crisis to come into your life so that he can fuel you to the place of personal revival, bringing you back to your first love. I'm going to close with this. Found in the book of Job chapter 2. When the wife of Job, amen, Amen. You know all the things that happened to Job. Lost the camel. Lost the sheep. Lost all his belongings. And then the scripture says that the walls fell upon his children. Ten of his children died with one accident. Amen. Amen. And Job's wife in the lowest of her life. Seeing all of the economical challenges. Seeing all of the health issues. Now the Bible says Job was filled with boils from his head to his feet. And he was sitting on ash and he was scraping himself. Go and read Job chapter 2. And while his wife looks at him. She says to him. Are you still holding on to your integrity with God? After God has done all of these things to you, you lost your children, you lost your belongings, you lost your possession, you lost your house. Now you are losing your health. Are you telling me that you are still holding on to your faith and to your integrity with this God? God and she says why don't you curse God and die how many times a woman said to your husbands I wish you were dead I wish you meet an accident while you're coming home I wish my children will never see you again I wish you die ah you're sitting so holy. And how many women, men said that? I wish I never married you because you look just like your mother. <laughs> I wish I never first met you. I made the greatest mistake of my life when I met you. I wish you die. Oh, I hear it all the time. Amen. Amen. And she said, why don't you curse God and die? Amen. When you are going through your crisis, don't curse God. When you're going through your curses, don't blame God. When you're going through your curses, don't blame the church. When you're going through your curses, don't crisis. When you're going through your crisis, don't blame men of God. We are too easy to blame God. Too easy to blame the church. Too easy to blame men of God. And you know what the scripture says? 
in all of these things that happened to Job, he did not sin with his lips. It simply means his heart was clean. His heart was pure. His heart was fixed in God. For they that know their God shall be strong. And do great exploits for him. Amen. If you know God, you will not sin with your lips. If you know God, your heart will be clean and will be righteous. And in the midst of your crisis, amen, don't curse God. Some of you are so tired of everything that the devil has thrown at you. You're fatigued. The scripture talks about Elijah. Amen. He comes from the place of victory. And all Jezebel said, when Ahab said to her that, jo, uh, that Elijah has killed 450 prophets of Baal, she sent him a message. The same things that you have done to the prophets, so shall I do with you tomorrow by this time. He ran from Jezebel. No woman is going to make me run. Some of you want to run. Amen. Amen. Jezebel made the man of God run. And I said to Pastor Adrian, no woman in this house is going to make me run. I'm going to stick here. Amen. And he sits under a juniper tree. Tired. Fatigued. Giving up. Hope is gone. Joy is gone. Control is gone. He's about throwing in the towel and the angel of the Lord. He falls asleep and the angel of the Lord gets him up, bakes him a bread and gives him water. God is about to refresh you. You might be tired. God is about to renew your strength. You might be giving up. God is about to restore everything that the devil has stolen, that the devil has taken from you. Amen. Amen.